Erica Hassel brings their background in ecology and mapping to their work on urban monarch butterflies for the Field Museum. Erica has always been interested in how migratory species conservation takes a landscape level approach and unites diverse landowners. Isa Rudlinski is an ecologist with immense love for native plants. She currently works to preserve existing nature in greater Chicago, create new green spaces and build functional urban habitat whenever possible. Over to you, Erica and Isa, and let me get your slides up and running. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, while we're waiting for the slides to join or to come up, if folks want to type into the chat where you're joining us from, it's always great to see where uh, people are signing in. One of the wonderful things about doing stuff on online on Zoom is we can see, um, we can share this with people from all over the country. So as you'll see from our slide, we're going to be talking about monarchs and also other pollinators, which is why it's lowercase. Uh, and we'll be talking about conservation in cities. Uh, it's something Isa and I are very passionate about. Um, I see somebody from uh, Maryland, Virginia, DC. I know Juliana's joining from Chicago. Um, this is fun. So as people are telling us where they're joining from and learning how to use the chat, I'll tell you about a little bit about where we're going to go today. We're going to talk about why a natural history museum in Chicago is talking to you about monarch butterflies, why we focus our work in cities and focus on insects when we could think about other kinds of urban wildlife, a little bit about what we're doing for urban wildlife, and eight things that you can do. Ooh, Virginia, Arizona. That's where we were just talking about all the bee diversity in Arizona. So before we start, I want to share something that we at the museum do before all of our presentations, which is um, to acknowledge they um, we want to acknowledge that the museum, um, our past collection and exhibition practices have deeply harmed native communities. Our native North American hall, which will open next year, will mark a new beginning. And we acknowledge that the Field Museum resides on the traditional homelands of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, the, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. And th this area was the site of trade, gathering, and healing from more than a dozen other native tribes. Nearly half a million tribal members currently make their home in the six states of the upper Midwest where we work. And we recognize that indigenous people are the traditional stewards of the land we now occupy, living here long before Chicago was a city and still thriving here today. Monarchs are a species that traverse indigenous lands across North America. The Parapacha people in Michoacan, Mexico, where the monarchs overwinter, track the, the butterfly's fall arrival, calling them the Paracata or harvester butterfly. Because the return signaled the time, that it was time to harvest the corn. The Parapacha believe that monarch butterflies are the souls of their deceased ancestors, returning for a brief annual visit. Deep cultural traditions connect indigenous people to this species and to their land. Indigenous people across North America play a vital role in conservation of this species. And I hope it's that connection between culture and monarch conservation that's something we can highlight throughout this talk. So we are, uh, you know, speaking to you from our homes, but normally uh, our, our home where, where we reside is the Field Museum of Natural History, located on the lakefront in Chicago. If, if you uh, have been to Chicago or been to the museum, you may know us best for our uh, very fine dinosaurs, uh, Sue the T-Rex, who's very sassy on Twitter, um, and our, our awesome mummies. We are a sort of traditional natural history museum in many ways. We're a collections-based institution with over um, 30 million objects in our collection, and we were established 125 years ago as part of the Chicago World's Fair. But what Isa and I are often excited about is what the museum is today. One of those things is that our largest exhibit by square footage is the Rice Native Gardens, pictured in the foreground in this photo, which is an exhibit to the native plants of Illinois and the upper Midwest. The museum is fueling a journey of discovery <clears throat> to enable solutions for a future rich in nature and culture. And it's that intersection of nature and culture that's really key to the work that our department does. 
We're called the Keller Science Action Center. We're a collection of multidisciplinary scientists and educators, engagement specialists. You'll see some of that in upcoming slides. And our focus is really taking that collections based knowledge from that massive long term library of life from every continent on Earth and turning that into conservation and quality of life for the people in the communities where we work. And where are those places? So we started in 1995 with like one and a half staff long before either I was at the department. And a lot of that work was centered in the Andes Amazon region of South America because of the incredible biodiversity in that region. The Amazon and it's really present in the news now is an incredibly important biodiversity resource for the entire world. And so in collaboration with the people in and around these spaces, our team has worked to increase protection on 26 million acres of land around the world. We also work in the Shikara region, out the front, back, and side door of the museum, um, a place where there's not 26 million acres to put into conservation, and that's not the path you'll see that we take with our work. But there are 10 million people, and it's the connection between those 10 million people and the wild spaces around them that's the focus of our work, building that connection and that incitement for the natural world. Because I hope, as we convey to you, it's the decisions that those 10 million people make and the other millions and millions of people in the United States that are incredibly important for protecting biodiversity. So a little bit of insight, because you're going to hear from Isa and I today, but we're just two members of a larger team. And the important thing to see about this is you're going to hear from two ecologists, but that's we're certainly not a team of just ecologists. We're social scientists, educators, engagement specialists, and it's that intersection of all of those disciplines that's incredibly important to our work. My name is Erica Hassel. Uh, I've been to the museum since 2009. I'm a fairly traditionally trained ecologist who is fascinated by migration. I do a lot with spatial sciences, GIS type stuff, uh, because I'm interested in why things were, are where they are and where they might be in the future. And I am incredibly excited to be here today to talk about monarchs. It's something I've been working on for about the last five years and I'm very passionate about. I'm going to let Isa introduce herself. Hi, I'm Isa Radlinski. I am also a conservation ecologist, but been with the Field Museum um, for five years now. Uh, but I sort of cut my teeth ecologically do during, doing large scale restoration at Medewin National Tall Grass Prairie. So that is the largest restoration east of the Mississippi River. Um, and that's where, you know, I started thinking a lot about how our uh, restoration practices and climate change come together and how can we monitor and evaluate our work to make sure we're most successful and then being with the field museum i sort of migrated more into urban ecology where it's um i would say tackling the same problems or issues but on a much smaller scale and also doing that um intersection with humans and what does it mean uh to work in cities because it you know, we're densely populated. Uh, so integrating people into my work. And um, I like to say that I'm an ecologist with a botany bias. <laughs> so cities need nature. And this is a, not a controversial phrase. Uh, so we build our cities in beautiful places and we add to them beautiful landscapes like botanic gardens or hosts today. And as people, we go to these spaces to feel restored and connected. And that was certainly highlighted in 2020 um, when we were all in lockdown. But it's a bigger question of the natural world needs cities. Often cities are portrayed as masses of concrete and seal completely devoid of the natural landscape, the antithesis of being in nature. But I, I disagree. Uh, cities are incredibly important to the natural world, not least because 80% of Americans live in a city, whether they think that they do or not. And urban places, there are over 300 cities in the United States with, 100, 000, with over 100,000 people in them. And what, I've, what we've done on this map is highlight the cities and put everything else kind of in, in a gray background tone because a lot of what is outside of cities is incredibly intensely used for agriculture uh, and it's made somewhat inhospitable, particularly to insect life. 
So what happens in cities not only can provide incredibly important habitat for wildlife, but also the decisions that the majority of people who live in cities make are important for how we think and build conservation into our future. We're going to be talking, uh, we're, I promise this is not going to be a depressing talk, uh, but we're going to start from a depressing place, uh, which is some of the further bad news that we all got last year, was some really startling documentation of the massive insect decline. There was a special section in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where they talked across the board about massive insect decline around the world. And we're gonna be pulling some things from this special section and kind of weaving them into our talk. Oops, I was a little ambitious to do that right then. <laughs> it's hard to sometimes notice something that declines a little bit over time. When they say death by a thousand cuts, it doesn't mean that we woke up one day and there were no more brown beetles on earth, brown beetles being among the most co common group of species. Um, that might be noticeable. If you woke up and there were no birds, that might be noticeable. But decreasing a little bit every year is hard to notice. One of the ways that you might notice that is I've been taking more road trips in the past couple of years. I don't know about anyone else. And the I remember, I'm old enough to remember that when you took a road trip in the summer, you had to stop and clean your windshield and gas stations had a little squeegee thing for cleaning off your windshield because so many bugs would get smashed on your car. And my family and I drove to Wisconsin and we didn't have to stop once this summer. And so it's a small thing, but yeah, if you look, there is a steady decline in the amount of insects in and around our world. And people talk about it becoming quieter uh, over the summer, you don't hear quite as many insect calls. One of those species that is that inspires so much wonder in all of us and why we came together today is the monarch butterfly. And I'll explain a little bit about the migration because we're at an important point in monarch migration today. So a few weeks ago, the monarchs that were in southern Canada and up here in the Midwest, where Isa and I are speaking from, a generation of monarchs was born. It was just a little bit bigger than previous generations. And they began moving southward toward Mexico. And if you kind of look around on the internet, you can see people posting radar images. They, they move in masses that show up on weather radar. So I saw one from the, the Texas area, from Oklahoma, where they were tracking the front of monarch migration. And they're moving southward to central Mexico along the border between Michoacan and state of Mexico where they were over winter on a specific kind of fir tree. And then in the spring down there close to the tropics, so like late February, those monarchs will begin a northward journey where they will breed, lay eggs, those will die. And then another generation will move northward into the Midwest, we'll have multiple generations, and then a generation that has never been to Mexico will make the migration the next year. That's pretty amazing. If you think about how far that is, thousands of miles for a tiny little insect to travel, birds make these kinds of migrations, but we don't think of insects making migrations that are that large. We're going to be talking today about this eastern population of monarch butterflies that are east of the Rocky Mountains, there's a Western population. There's also a population in, in Florida that doesn't migrate. We're not going to talk about those really today, but that just to explain this, um, this map. So that's a thing that people know about monarch butterflies. Before we go on, uh, I want to say something about the monarch reserve in Mexico, because we're going to talk a lot about the kind of the amount of work that we do here in the United States to protect and preserve monarch butterflies, but we're absolutely not alone. This is something that we do with partners in Canada and Mexico. And Mexico plays a really important role because they are the overwintering home of the monarch butterfly. I like working on migratory species because it, it knits people from across the migration route together. And this is a place where we're knitting three countries together. So this central image, this is the Omael trees, the firs that they overwinter on. And this rust is millions of butterflies hanging from the trees. It looks like the trees 
or sick or something, but it's butterflies hanging on them. And we will talk about the population of monarchs and what's happening with the population. That information is recorded by staff and volunteers at the uh, Monarch Sanctuary in collaboration with the World Wildlife Fund. And the Monarch Sanctuary is a, is a tourist attraction, both domestically for people in Mexico and internationally for tourists to come visit. It's a place that you can go visit. Uh, it's a place like many other tourist attractions that has struggled with revenue loss because of COVID. There's an international fund to support them with money contributed both by Mexico and by outside foundations. So their work is incredibly important and we should acknowledge that it, it is dangerous. Um, staff from the sanctuary have, have been murdered um, in part with through their work of protecting the monarch sanctuary. So I just wanna acknowledge that th that work as we're then about to talk about all the things that we do here, we couldn't do it without what happens in Mexico. The other thing is why, you know, we said we were gonna talk about monarch uh, butterflies and you all joined us and that's awesome. But we're also going to talk about other pollinators. And one of the reasons that Isa and I talk so much about monarchs is because of their phenomenal migration, because of the important conservation around them, but also because of the important connect cultural connections and the stories that monarchs bring out. You know, people do not send us pictures of their kids excitedly holding bees and flies. Uh, we get pictures of people's kids holding butterflies. People do not invite us to speak at their fall fly festival uh, about fly pollination or brown beetle pollination. People invite us to talk about monarch butterflies and that's awesome because the things that we do for monarch butterflies benefit a lot of other pollinators and there are a whole host of pollinators that are important. But the monarchs provide all of us a story. I get excited when I see a monarch and I've been doing this for years. Um, they give us this connection to Mexico to Canada. They're giving me a connection as they migrate to Texas. I'm from Texas and I get to think about butterflies migrating across where I grew up. It's a powerful connection and, and talking about stories and building stories into conservation is incredibly important because otherwise it's just this depressing slide where I'm going to tell you about insect decline. Nobody gets excited for these stories about um, insect decline. So this is an image from that paper. But I've simplified a little bit so it works on PowerPoint. But it is illustrating those thousand cuts, those challenges that insects face in surviving on our heavily altered landscape. And you could chalk a lot of these up in the northeast quadrant to broadly to climate change. We're having a drought here um, in the county where Ease <clears throat> and I are located. I talked about the challenge of the intensely managed agricultural landscape for insects, uh, where insecticides, herbicides, huge alteration to the landscape for the production of, of food is a big challenge for, um, for our pollinators. Here, they're, they're talking about urbanization as a challenge, and it is. There are plenty of, there are plenty of kinds of wildlife that can't survive and can't navigate urban landscapes. Many of our pollinators can, and there are ways to do urbanization in ways that are more hospitable to wildlife. And we're going to talk a lot about that. They're talking about fertilizer and the image that they're showing is, is a person fertilizing their yard. And that's weird until we tell you that the largest irrigated crop by far is turf grass. Management of turf grass is a huge input throughout, North, throughout the United States. And, and it is a quite a big challenge for our waterways for management of water and the amount of fertilizer, herbicide and insecticides that are used to create those green lawns. So we're gonna talk about some alternatives. Now, uh, actually, before I drop into this, I think we have an additional poll. Uh, so we have, so I should say, I'm excited to see that 60% of people joining us have talked about the fact that there is milkweed in their local park or community garden. Let's talk a little bit about what monarch butterflies eat. So while I'm doing this next slide, please chime in and say, what do the adults eat? The generation that's migrating now, what are they eating along the way? And I promise this would not be a, a depressing presentation we can't talk about monarchs without talking about the decline. 
So this is the population of Eastern monarch butterflies that, oh, I can't see the poll until I uh, respond. So I better respond. Okay. Um, so please do do the poll uh, while I'm talking if you're a multitasker. So the Eastern population, which is the one we'll be talking about, it's, and I said, folks, at the monarch sanctuary measure how many butterflies there are. It's too many butterflies to ever count. So they actually measure the area of trees that are occupied. And this is a pretty well-established protocol. And it's in Mexico, so it's in hectares. But you can see that in the mid 90s, there was some, there was like 18 hectares of butterflies that were overwintering, which right now is, is staggering because what we're seeing nowadays is closer to two hectares. There's a blue line at six because that's what really good science tells us is the average that we need to maintain to sustain the population. Not to have the population grow, not to have the population do well, but to be confident that we will continue to have monarch butterfly migrations for the reasonable future. So monarch butterflies, in fact, have uh, they're on like a, essentially a watch list for being listed as an endangered species in the United States, which is very serious. Uh, it means that the Fish and Wildlife Service is monitoring closely the population. Actually, the Western population in California is doing much worse. They've fallen to less than 10,000 individuals. So monarchs are, in a way, as I said, a good way to tell the story because they are not the only insect for which this is happening. They're just the insect that uh, we're going to talk about, the insect that makes a really cool migration, that makes a good story. Um, and they're an insect where the conservation we do for them is going to benefit a lot of other species. So before my next slide, I will see that almost 70% or 70% of people said that adult monarchs drink nectar from flowers, which is correct. And almost everyone else uh, selected milkweed plants, which is almost correct. That's what they eat when they're a caterpillar. So this is what's really interesting because, and this is true for a lot of, a lot of species in general, but we talk about this a lot with migratory species, that they need different things in different parts of their lives. So you could have a field of infinite milkweed, blanket the entire United States in milkweed, and we would not sustain the monarch butterfly population if we didn't have other flowers blooming throughout the season. We need those really important early spring flowers. We need those flowers right now here in the Midwest. It's the asters blooming that are fueling um, monarchs that haven't left who need to get out of here. Uh, but our bees, they're fueling up for the winter. And you could have the most wonderful diverse prairie with flowers blooming all throughout the season and not sustain the monarch butterfly if you didn't have milkweed or plants in the Asclepius genus as part of that, because that's the only place where adult monarchs will lay eggs and that's the only food that the caterpillars will eat. A lot of insects have these sort of host plant relationships with different species or groups of species. And so uh, people also said fruit, and so you can put out fruit to attract butterflies, uh, but really to sustain them, because they, they do that, drink that sugar water, but to sustain all, all of our pollinators, we really need those um, flowers that are also producing pollen. So why, why are we, the people telling you this, and why are we telling you about cities? Because uh, about five years ago, the Fish and Wildlife Service, when monarchs, there was a petition to list them as an endangered species. And Fish and Wildlife needed to know more about them in order to make that decision. They asked us and some other collaborators to really look at the potential for cities. Because uh, certainly here in the Midwest, an acre of Midwest farmland is incredibly valuable. And taking that out of production is difficult. It's expensive. There are lots of pesticides already in that landscape. And it can be a difficult place to sustain um, to, to, to make that change, to, to add milkweed back to the landscape, which isn't to say the agricultural landscape isn't important, it's incredibly important, but cities are also important. So they asked us to look and see like, how much milkweed is in cities? How's that doing? And we spent a long time doing that and we wrote some papers that are in Frontiers, uh, which is a journal about that and we were excited to see them get press. But what we came out of that with is that cities can contribute um, up to a third 
of the milkweed needed to stabilize the eastern population. And we need to add 1.8 billion stems of milkweed to the landscape. So we need cities, we need agricultural lands, we need conservation lands, we need what the Fish and Wildlife has said, all hands on deck to achieve that goal. So we were happy to see that cities could be part of the solution. Now, as uh, statistics would tell me that 80% of people joining this call are perhaps from a city, if not more. And city folks know that cities are not all the same. Uh, it's not all the concrete and steel. Uh, all of Chicago does not look like Manhattan. And I live in a neighborhood of Chicago, which doesn't look anything like downtown Chicago. There are many different types of land use is the sort of term of art for that in cities. One of those is open space. Um, open space that's dedicated for conservation, um, county parks, state parks, federal protected lands, botanical gardens, and open spaces that are more for recreation, like city parks, golf courses, ball fields, that kind of thing. And those have a lot of potential to add milkweed. Also, uh, maybe somewhat surprisingly, are those utility rights of way, roadways. You think about all that land along the side of the highway where some of us may have first seen milkweed. Uh, and you add that up and it's a lot of land. The, I think the power company in Illinois is like one of the largest landholders just because they own the area under the transmission lines and that really adds up. But the real potential that uh, you may have noticed because we highlighted it in blue and made an arrow pointing to it is the residential land. All of those yards that may or may not be maintained as turf grass are a huge potential to add milkweed and other native plants to the landscape. But of course, there's a challenge. You know, if you go to the state park and you have some money and you work with a few people and convert five acres to a prairie, uh, you can be reasonably certain that that's going to stay a prairie for a while and that place is going to stay a state park. But if you work with somebody and you get them to plant milkweed, you know, this fall, um, and that milkweed comes back in the spring, but maybe they, you know, they accidentally mow it or they just, they're not interested in it anymore. It's a much more retail process to talk to many, many, many landowners to make those changes. So that got us thinking, how can we do this more efficiently? And that kind of brings us to the meat of our talk today. So another paper from that same uh, Proceedings of the Natural Academy of Sciences talked about the eight simple actions that individuals can take to save insects from global decline. And so we're going to take those actions. We're going to tell you how they apply to monarchs and other pollinators. We're going to tell you how they could apply, hopefully, to your spaces. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Isa to get started. Thank you, Erica. And uh, yeah, we're going to, you know, not just talk about the problems, but the ways that we can contribute to the solutions. And if you're like, I'd rather listen to Erica, that's okay. She'll be back. They will be back um, and talking to us. So, uh, so the first step is converting our lawns to habitat. And it's not just me saying that. It's actually the scientific paper suggesting it. So um, as Erica has mentioned, Lawn is our biggest crop right now. So it's bigger than all the corn we have or all the soybean that we produce in the United States. And if you know anything about a lawn or have neighbors with really beautiful lush green lawn, that takes a whole bunch of water resources, takes a whole bunch of uh, fertilizer uh, effort, um, you know, reseeding, patching and all of that. And um, not to be unkind to deserts, but because deserts are teeming with life, especially as we know, 500 bee species in one of the deserts uh, in the US, but our lawns are ecological deserts, as in like, there's not much growing there. So converting that space into uh, a beautiful area that has a lot of biodiversity um, is a great way to go. And you can do it in many different ways. Um, the picture on the right that you're seeing is, you know, someone who's gone all gang ho and like the whole front yard is a beautiful pollinator prairie garden. And uh, that's great. But sometimes we don't have that much space. And sometimes, uh, you know, you have kids or a dog and you want them to run around on grass and that's also acceptable. But small spaces can also hold a lot of power. And that is, you can see the picture on the left, that's the old place I used to live in. 
And that strip is about a foot and a half wide and it just runs along uh, the side of the house we lived in. And that was all in native plants. And I had like over 20 different species growing in there. So that was, uh, that's an opportunity. That area, you know, can have nothing growing in it, can have hostas. I'm prejudiced against hostas, I have to admit. Um, or it can be theming with life, with different things that grow there. And, you know, um, as you're planting new things into your lawn and getting rid of, um, of, of the grass that's, you know, being caught, um, you can participate in a whole bunch of different community science um, uh, projects, including our own. So what is uh, community science, you will ask me? Uh, well, it also goes by the name uh, citizen science. Uh, and it's a way to engage everyday people to collect data to answer scientific questions. That's all it is. Scientists can be everywhere. Uh, there's not enough of us and there's not enough funding to pay us to collect data all the time. But there's a lot of people who uh, can help us with that. So we have a Monarch Community Science Project um, that you can check out, but it's for Chicagoland region only, where we ask participants to count the number of eggs and caterpillars on their milkweed once a week and record that so we can uh, establish what makes a successful monarch garden in an urban space. And what we haven't expected, but we got is the stories. In addition to the data, we got the stories and people's sort of emotional connection to their gardens. Um, and also it shows that when one person starts doing this, it can influence others. It can have that a domino effect. And so Kirkney told us that today while I was completing the survey, my neighbor saw me and we started talking about what I was doing. Now he wants to plant milkweeds because they are good for monarchs. So you, um, by removing lawn, are becoming an ambassador for other people as well. Um, and, you know, it's important because just like Erica has said, we have so much residential area that could be converted. That could be your front lawn. That could be your back lawn. That could be the side strip along the fence. Uh, and let's not forget our schools, libraries, places of worship. All of those can have a community garden in there. Um, and the really cool thing is, uh, I'm just like referring to Erica all the time, that a third of those milkweeds that we need to sustain the population where they are can be grown in urban areas. And if you're thinking, hey, Isa, but that's like, you know, someone in the chat mentioned they have an eighth of an acre all in milkweed. Is that what I need to do? I can't commit to that. I'm here to tell you that, you know, we've gone, we published a paper on this and the data was for an exemplary uh, garden. You had to have something between roughly 200 to 400 milkweed stems per acre per Chicago standard lot, which is 25 by 125, that converts to between 16 and 30 stems of milkweeds. And I can tell you that's doable because I have that going on in my yard. Uh, sometimes one plant is multiple stems. Um, and it's not like I have a crazy amount of space. I have some space in the back and some space up front by my staircase. And that is uh, that low amount of area is an exemplary site. So if a small percentage of people did what I did throughout the US, um, we'd be set, sort of. So I uh, just want you to feel like, you know, one person doing it won't really make a dif uh, difference, but that combined effort really does. And you have that power to, co to change your yard and influence others to do it. So, um, and then when we're also, you know, changing and taking out lawn, we're converting that area to natural habitat and we're converting it in a way that will create home and food for insects. It will, that home is necessary part of it, right? Creating that shelter. So what do insects need? Just like all the organisms, they need shelter, place to, to create a home, food and water. So when you are cleaning up your garden for winter, don't get rid of all the thatch and don't clean up all the leaves. They are super important. A, a lot of our pollinators lay their eggs on the leaves. So when you're bagging the leaves out, you're bagging a lot of the moths and butterflies and other things. 
Um, if you like um, fireflies, leave the leaves on there because they feed on things that feed on those decaying leaves. Um, if, well, the larvae of the fireflies. Uh, a lot of our bees, about 70% of our solitary, non-stinging native bees nest in the ground. So those leaves create a beautiful uh, blanket for them. Uh, that's also important why we shouldn't clean up the garden too early in the spring. Like I know we get that March warm weather and all of us are like, oh, the daffodils will be blooming. We need to clean out the garden. Take a deep breath. Wait, wait for 10 consecutive days of temperatures above 50 before you do that. That's when the bees wake up and they emerge and they don't need that blanket anymore. And then when you're cutting back vegetation, leave some stems standing because the remaining 30% of bees are cavity nesters and they will use the hollow stems of your flowers and grasses to nest there. And if you're thinking, well, my neighbors are gonna help hate me because it's gonna look messy. We're doing this at the Field Museum. We're a big institution, you can see the picture on the top right. We're letting the grass stand, we're letting the plants stand and we're not cleaning it up until it's spring. So, um, you know, tell them that you've been told not to do that. Blame it on us, pretty much. Uh, we'll give you our email if a neighbor wants to um, email us and complain. But, you know, we're converting those lands to habitat, but how do we do it? Well, the second point, they said grow native plants. And I sort of alluded to it, and so has Erica. Um, but what does it mean? What are native plants? What is it that we were talking about? Native plants are plants that have evolved in a given region for thousands of years. Uh, they're used to, you know, the cold winters that you might have up in Maine or the really hot summers that we have in Chicago or both. And the native plants in Chicago might not be the native plants you have in New Jersey, for example. Uh, there might be some overlap. Uh, and then if it's even the same species, the ecotype, so the genetic information in the population by Chicago might be a little different and used to slightly different environment than the one, say, in New Jersey, if we have an overlap, like low blue stems, one of those grasses that's spread throughout. So native plants are plants that have been here for a long time. And because of that, they have evolved special relationships with a lot of the insects. So if there are bees or... Um, other insects that rely on a plant X, that plant is there when they need its resources. You know that uh, so many things are blooming when the monarchs get to us because the monarchs as adults need nectar, but that's when the milkweed has fresh new leaves uh, growing. And those leaves are, you know, what provides the great food for the caterpillars. So, you know, our rice native gardens, as Erica has mentioned, um, is our biggest exhibit, and we are showing it as a demonstration garden. But we don't only work, you know, on 100,000 square feet because we're the field museum. We also have these demonstration gardens in communities. I've worked on a garden by a church on an area in Chicago that has least green space. And then we also work, uh, you know, showing how this can look on person's front or backyard. And we use our rice native gardens to support um, the communities throughout Chicago. Uh, we have distributed almost 18,000 milkweed and other pollinator friendly plants over the last five seasons throughout Chicagoland. You can see the map of where things go. We really try hard to distribute it equitably. And then we also collect seeds because that 100,000 acres is a lot of seed just waiting to be collected and cleaned. And we distribute it to community gardens um, in our area so that habitat can be uh, spread out. So when we're um, growing these native plants, we're supporting the intricate relationships with insects. So just like the monarchs need a milkweed plant for their caterpillars, all the lepidoptera, meaning butterflies and moths, need a special plant or maybe a few special plants that their caterpillars will eat. So swallowtails need things in the parsley family, etc. With many bees, um, they need a special plant for pollen to make a pollen ball to lay their egg on uh, for the um, baby bees to develop their sort of cute. Um, so goldenrods, for example, there are over a hundred species of bees that rely only on goldenrods to make their pollen balls for the um, little baby bees. 
Um, so having a variety of um, different shapes and different flowers growing at different times of the year will really help um, the populations of, of uh, different insects. That diversity of plants and when they bloom and how they look and what colors they have will translate into that diversity of insects. So have something blooming from spring to fall. And for example, in the top, we have some things that bloom here in Chicagoland in the spring from Virginia bluebells, shooting stars, St. Coriopsis and golden alexanders uh, to things that bloom in the fall, uh, goldenrods and asters and ironweeds. Uh, and they're all beautiful. They're really nice in a garden setting. They might be unruly, but so will other plants that you buy in a garden center. Um, you will have to garden similarly by culling, tying, as you would uh, do traditionally. And, you know, there are native plants for all conditions. If you have a shady, dry area where nothing wants to grow, there's a native plant for that. You have a sunny, wet area that's flooded for uh, a month and then it's bone dry in the summer. There's a plant for that. So you just got to uh, find out what the plants are that like the same conditions and plant them. And as you're planting them, try to group plants. Uh, some research finds that if uh, plants of the same species are grouped together, they will attract pollinators more easily, especially with milkweeds. And some preliminary research shows, and we're actually um, checking, testing that question in our uh, Monarch Community Science Project, that um, milkweeds that are on the outskirts of the patch, so not in the middle or intermixed within the patch, but on the sides of the patch, uh, seem to be a little more uh, successful in attracting monarch butterflies and laying eggs. And of course, when we talk about, um, uh, cat uh, about pollinators, and you're like, yeah, but you know, I really care about the birds, I wanna say that insects are bird food. And whatever we do that's good for the pollinators will attract everything up in the food chain. Uh, so we plant the plants, the insects will come and eat the plants. There's some insects that will eat the insects, and then there will be birds that feed on it. And even if they're songbirds that usually, you know, eat seeds or other things, the baby birds, the, the chicks, 96% uh, of them are fed insects. Uh, and you can imagine why. They're like tasty, fatty morsels of deliciousness for a bird. Um, and there's Dorothy here, that's Erica's child, with a completely decimated uh, dill plant. But you can see why. There's six uh, swallowtails, uh, caterpillars on that, just munching away. Um, so at this point, you might be like, okay, Isa, I got it. Like... I know I'm supposed to get rid of my lawn, plant native plants, but like, how do I know which native plants are right? And where do I buy them? And how do I arrange them? This is complicated. You can go to native um, plant finder. So Google that, there'll be also a link in the chat and you put in your zip code and you'll get probably somewhere between 150 to 250 different plants that can grow in your zip code. And if you're thinking this is overwhelming, I agree with you. Um, so there's other resources that will help you narrow it down. Um, we have created uh, a guide to creating an urban habitat for monarchs in a Midwestern garden. You're more than welcome to download that. Uh, we have also created a sort of a guide to creating community pollinator gardens. Um, so, you know, if you want to create a pollinator garden by school, church, library, etc. How do you go about it? Uh, because it can be the best garden, but if you know the one person in charge of it gets um, really burned out, in a few years it's gonna overgrow and then someone's gonna wanna mow it. So how do you make sure that this garden is thriving both on engaging the community and doing its ecological thing? So some resources for us over there. Also contact your state's native plant society. So I'll go really quick because now we have converted our lawns to habitat using native plants. But by doing that, we can reduce the pesticide and herbicide uh, input. 
Uh, pretty much if you see insects that are eating your plants and you don't want them there, like aphids, I encourage you to take a deep breath, wait two weeks, and something will come up, like a good bug will come up that will eat your um, um, bed pest. This is pretty much the predator-prey cycle at work. And um, we know that spraying one insect affects all insects. There is an aphid-specific or a mosquito-specific chemical out there. Whatever you do to kill insects, uh, like mosquitoes or aphids, will affect other insects. So try to do it in a way that will not uh, harm non-target insects, or just wait a few weeks and try for Mother Nature to take its part. Other things we can do is turn off our lights at night because a lot of those lights will attract uh, moths and other pollinators who then fly themselves to exhaustion and pretty much die. And we understand that light is a safety thing. So if you have to have light on, make sure you switch to bulbs with like an amber or red color. And then when you're using chemicals to like washing your driveway, or maybe washing your car. A lot of these chemicals, when they run off, they go into our sewage system that then is spitted out straight to the river. So the stuff that's caught on the street is not the same stuff that's caught. It's, it's a different sewage system than what's caught in our home. And whatever makes it to waterways affects aquatic insects, dragonflies, and so many other things. So make sure you try to limit that as well as salt use in winter. And I'm going to Pass the Bhutan back to Erica. I'm going to remember to unmute myself. So a few things as we're wrapping up, and then we'll be happy to answer questions. So feel free to pop questions into the questions tab as you have them. We're also having a great conversation in the chat. So welcome folks to join us there. So one of the things that we try to do with our community science project is reduce the negative image that people have of insects. You know, it's it's a real thing that in a lot of, um, that we ask people to plant native plants and uh, then attract insects. And then sometimes we do get questions about, oh, well, I have all these bugs in my yard or I planted some uh, St. John's wort bushes, which are wonderful bumblebee magnets. And uh, my neighbor was like, well, what are we going to do about that when my grandkids come over? You know, how are we going to keep them away from these insects? And that's one of the things that we think community science or, or citizen science really excels at because it gives people a, a way in a daily or weekly basis to see what the garden is doing. Um, it's one of the reasons that we created our community science project, which is part of a national monarch larva monitoring project that can be joined anywhere in the US. And if you, I encourage folks to look in your area, there are almost certainly um, a monarch specific project to your area. There are national bee monitoring projects because it gives you a place to see that daily connection. And then when you become the educator and the advocate to your neighbor of saying, well, actually, bumblebees are not going to attack your grandchild. That's most often hive uh, honeybees, domestic European bees. And uh, actually, these honeybees are these um, bumblebees are doing awesome things for our landscape. We pr try to provide educational materials uh, on our website, uh, fieldmuseum.org, fieldguides.fieldmuseum.org, I think. Anyway, we have it. It can be dropped into the chat. Um, we have these guides, not just to creating a garden in your Midwestern yard. They do tend to be a little Midwestern focused, but these are free to print for anyone. Uh, so having these things, being able to identify things is sometimes helpful. We talked about the fact that um, people don't often send us pictures of their kids with things besides monarchs, as you see two pictures of our children with monarchs. Often what you see in media is actually negative images. Uh, these are from like children's uh, story, you know, Winnie the Pooh, which I read to my kid, and then the bees are like the villain of the story. So often bees and wasps are the villains of stories. And I know that there are other children's books out now that have a more positive portrayal, but the classics, uh, the things that we tend to see, even there's a magic school bus active, uh, magic school bus episode where they get chased by a bumblebee, which I was really bummed about because my child loves magic school bus. 
So these things are important where we are not only teaching the next generation, but we're really becoming the ambassadors in our area. One of the things we did with our community science project is we gave people yard signs so that they can sort of demonstrate to their neighbors like, oh, I'm, I'm doing something. And that can be really important. Registering your garden can be part of that. This is a map of just our distribution across uh, the area around Chicago. We are, uh, we can't invite everyone in the country. We're sort of a Chicago focused project. A lot of the questions are Midwest uh, special. And I already did that one. Um, so one of the things that's come through this project that's been exciting is seeing all these different kinds of gardens, which Isa highlighted that we would never have found this without doing a community science project. We've learned some things along the way um, that this is only one year of data, so this is nowhere near publication worthy. One of the things that, that we took away, and Isa already highlighted some of these, is that it's fine to just have one species of milkweed. It doesn't seem like having multiple species is uh, particularly important for monarchs, although it can be important if you have different soil needs in your yard. The number of plants is probably important, although that could be related to actually the, the older the planting, the more successful that they were. Gardens in their first year were often not as successful, and that's actually been borne out in our second year of data this year. That having a few more plants and that second, that third year, you get a lot more success. Uh, you know, the size, so these sizes are quite small. I saw somebody asking, like, is an eighth of an acre enough? And part of the reason that our project is kind of tied to that Chicago area is we're looking at very small patches, smaller than most people have looked at, because we want to know that they can be useful. So finally, the last thing is that we'll ask you to do before we move to questions is, oh, that's bad. It is just to act locally. There's a lot of things that we can do locally. I talked about registering your garden. So uh, we give people signs for our project. There's a National Monarch Way Station. There's, um, there's a Fish and Wildlife Foundation one that's escaping me at the moment <laughs> um, where you can register. In your municipality, there is a, a pledge that cities can take to do different, to do things for monarchs and this is, the municipalities around Chicago, although you notice Chicago has not signed the Mayor's Monarch Pledge. So uh, you can work with your municipality. There are specific actions that cities do every year to be part of that, it's sort of like being a tree city USA. And um, there's a great example from Minnesota where they have the Lawns to Legumes project where residents actually get some help, some cost share help in converting their lawn to be more bee friendly. So talking with your local municipality about ways that you can support your neighbors in planting is awesome. And so I know that also like the, the US Botanic Gardens, they're dropping something into the chat uh, about a community science project with the Smithsonian. So another awesome natural history museum. So with that, I will move to, um, we'll move into questions uh, easy, we can take a look in the chat. I know you've been answering a lot of questions in the chat. Um, yeah. So one of those is, um, I think is somebody talking about seeing different, oh, Grace, do you want to ask the questions? You know, you guys are, you have been so good with tackling these questions. So if you feel most comfortable going through the chat yourself, I'm, I'm totally okay with that. I've got some backup questions too, if we need some more. And I hope um, I was comprehensive in answering them. I have a hard time typing and listening at the same time. So um, apologies. I think, no, I think one of the questions that I, I'm seeing is, you know, um, as monarchs move through, uh, as the larva move through all of the milkweed in your patch, that can be a challenge. I think that's one of the reasons that we see that older, more established gardens are a little more successful. They do tend to leave the milkweed when they are ready to form that chrysalis. So I know I have found a monarch, a large monarch caterpillar like trucking through my yard, moving away from the milkweed, clearly looking for a place to go form that chrysalis because that 
we think that helps them hide from predators. Yeah, and and there are many different types of predators um, that eat your monarch caterpillar and or egg, from spiders and ants to wasps. Um, birds, because the caterpillars eat milkweed, and milkweed is called milkweed because of white um, sap made with latex. The caterpillars aren't um, on the delicious side of things, so not that many birds will eat them. But there's definitely... Uh, wasps that will lay eggs on top of them or inside of them. Nature is brutal. Uh, spiders will eat eggs. Um, same with ants. So there are a lot of pre uh, pre uh, predators on those. And I think estimates differ, but in a wild setting, somewhere between 3 to 10% of the um, monarchs uh, actually make it from egg to caterpillar. Well, I've got a question for um, Lisa and Erica. I know a lot of folks are interested in rearing uh, monarchs sort of in their home. And I would se kind of separate that from like uh, butterfly farms. But do you have any uh, thoughts or recommendations for folks who might be interested in maybe taking a more active approach in, in rearing butterflies? It's throwing us into the deep end. Uh, this, this is hotly debated topic in monarch circles. So yeah, I think there's an important distinction between places that raise 5,000 monarchs uh, to release at weddings and stuff. And that, that probably really could be a challenge. There's worries about disease and genetics of the population. I think people who, and this has been one of the struggles with our project, because in our project, you can't collect in rear monarchs. And seeing that significant drop off of I have eggs, I have eggs, but I never see caterpillars, people do leave the project because of that. So I, I can completely understand. And so what, one of the things we do is if people are studying a project for our, pro, our um, studying an area for our project, we ask them to have like a separate place where they collect and rear eggs because it is really awesome to see. It's something that I've done with my kids. I'm pretty sure Isa has done with her kids. And I, I will say that I think my husband was just as moved as the kids, if not more. Uh, so it's not just for the children, it's for adults too. Yeah. So the Monarch Joint Venture uh, is a national monarch organization. Uh, it's actually an umbrella of organizations. They have great information on their website about the sort of best way to do it for monarchs. You, the main thing you want to do is just really clean between generations. Or, or not necessarily generations, but between groups of monarchs that you raise. Uh, another thing that not a lot of people tell you is occasionally if you got like a, a big one, like a fourth or fifth instar stage in there and you got a little one, that little one might get eaten. It's not a malicious thing. They're just not good. Um, they're just sort of eating machines. And a little tiny caterpillar is very different. So you may want to separate them. There's a whole system you can find where you do it in Starbucks cups. Um, another thing just to say is if you're not collecting them as eggs, if you're maybe like me collecting a second or third in star or stage that you find, that thing might, uh, might have already been parasitized by a wasp and what will come out of your chrysalis is a wasp, which I thought would be very traumatic to my child and he loved it. It was like the coolest thing. It was like magic. So I don't know if any of that was exactly advice, but yeah, it's fun. There is, I guess, another sense that, um, especially if you're doing it late in the season, you might be rearing a, mi a migratory monitor, to do it in a mesh enclosure outside or at least near a window, not near enough to get them cooked. But that change in the day length and position of the sun could be important in signaling them to migrate. Certainly weather is part of it. We had monarchs begin their migration here in Chicago and it was still like real hot. So giving them, helping them have that signal to migrate, that could be important. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of, you know, it's a hotly debated issue because rearing a monarch is so emotional and it's just so beautiful. But the research is clear. Um, if you're rearing a lot of them, that's not good for them. Um, so, you know, rearing five, 10, that's okay. But once you start getting larger numbers, 
Uh, they're not as strong. They're not as good as finding their direction. I mean, at the University of Chicago, they did a study where they measured how strong uh, a, um, they're clasping onto things. I mean, I imagine like low monarchs with, you know, drum bells, but it's not exactly what they did. Um, and unfortunately, that is the case. One way to improve, but not have it as good as monarchs reared in the wild is to have it where they can get the sun exposure. Um, and then, you know, there's there's a lot of disease, like Erica mentioned, there's OE, um, and a lot of the monarchs that are reared um, in large numbers, that uh, parasite can be moved around, and then it moves around around them. They leave it on a flower, a wild monarch sits on it, they get it, and it can decimate the population. Thank you for that information. We've got um, a couple more questions in the chat, and then I think we'll we'll let you um, continue on with your day. And so let's take um, a question from Kate. We've got, what are some typical places for a caterpillar to form a chrysalis? Ooh, we found out under people's porches. <laughs> yeah, it, so we when we started, we told people, like, you're not going to find a chrysalis. I've never seen one in the wild. And then that first year, like five people sent us pictures of chrysalises that they'd found under patio tables, uh, under the edges of sightings. So it turns out they're a lot easier to find in the urban landscape. I have still, I have now seen an empty chrysalis in the wild, but still not an active chrysalis in the wild. Um, if you have your milkweed growing in a pot, which uh, you know is also a part of our project, we encourage people who are doing plantings um, in containers, which had not really been studied before. Sometimes they'll just form under the lip of the container. So that's that's kind of cool. And it's a way to sort of see one get reared in the wild. And I dropped the Monarch Joint Venture Raising Monarchs handout in the chat. Thank you. And we'll take one more question today. Um, we've got Judy saying, I heard something about a lesser known southward fifth migration before the batch that goes to Mexico. Do you have any information on that? Ooh, um, I mean, there is sometimes a, so sometimes, usually we would say there's four generations. There is sometimes a fifth generation that squeezes in there. Um, and I guess that, well, is, it, is this in the new isotope paper? <laughs> that we skimmed this morning? I think so, that's there. Okay. Uh, but there's also people say that that fifth generation might be a result of climate change. I think that was previous, um, you know, like when they hang out for a little too long before heading south. Or if you have uh, milkweed plants like tropical milkweed, which, you know, um uh, can bloom well into november uh and that gives a cue to the monarchs like hey it's it's not winter it doesn't matter it's 50 degrees but look this milkweed's blooming that means it's middle of the summer and the later they start their migration the more likely they're hit by a hail storm or a winter storm and you know not make it you know i think it's it's interesting that we're still really piecing the migration together. It was only 1975 that the overwintering location of the Eastern population was nailed down. It was actually sooner- By scientists. But, well, and, and in collaboration with, uh, it, with local folks, it was a, right. a collaboration between people that lived in the community and a scientist to kind of find those locations for the overwintering population. And, in that map I showed of the movement, some of those arrows have still little questions on them because understanding which butterflies are going where because they don't quite have a GPS tracker small enough uh, for a monarch yet. Um, the, the tracking, which is fun, you can sign up for tags to tag a monarch. And it, it's really just like a little paper tag that they put on the wing. And then if that monarch is recovered, they know where the tag was issued and sort of where that monarch might have gone. Um, so it's still, it's we're still in the low tech territory. Um, I would look now-ish because I know they run out of tags every year. So if you are thinking about rearing a few, especially with a school or something, um, getting some tags is really fun. Uh, and actually somebody from um, 
Was it Oak Brook? A suburb of Chicago. Had her their tag- monarch make it all the way down there. Yeah, her recovered monarch, her tagged monarch was recovered at the overwintering. So that's cool. Yeah, I mean, the chances, right, that like you tag it, that it makes it down there, and then that it's checked amongst the millions of monarchs um, are, yeah, increasingly dwindling with each step. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Erica and Isa. This was a fascinating um, program, and I know I learned a lot. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity.